We'll see how far we get with this. Deuteronomy 1. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 1. I started a series a couple of weeks ago, and then I was out last week, sick. Brother Caleb did a great job uh, when um, temptation meets opportunity or something like that. I think I got that right on Joseph. Is that what you preached on? I thought that's what you preached on. And um, I want to pick back up tonight with part two of this message. <clears throat> if you're in Deuteronomy chapter number one, just remain seated. Look with me, if you would, in verse 26. This is, this is the children of Israel at Kadesh Barnea. They have come out of Egypt. You've got the ten plagues, came out of Egypt. They've come through the wilderness. Uh, they are standing on the edge of the Jordan River. God's will is for them to cross on over, possess the land. They sent in the 12 spies. 12 spies came back with differing reports. 10 were bad and 2 were good. Remember that? And uh, the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy chapter number 1, verse number 26, Moses said, Notwithstanding, you would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. And you murmured in your tents and said, because the Lord hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. We preached a message entitled The Delusions of Disobedience. I won't repeat all of that. If you missed it, you'll have to go back and listen to it. Make a lot more sense what I got to say tonight if you go back and listen to that other message. But I can't repeat it I will just remind you that last time we looked at the delusions of disobedience causes people to be delusional about reality. When they disobeyed in verse number 26, and let's make no mistake, them saying we will not go up and rebelling against the commandment of the Lord was an act of deliberate disobedience. And when that happened, when that act of disobedience was done in their hearts and in their minds, the devil succeeded in putting a foot in the door, it caused them to start seeing so many things completely opposite from the way it really was. I guess the truth that I was trying to bring out a couple of weeks ago that I'd like to, if I can't even tonight, bring out is that when you and I disobey an, uh, an, uh, an act of disobedience of something that we know God wants us to do, the devil will then begin to work in your heart and in your mind. He will begin to give you all kinds of reasons to try and justify it, reasons to try to defend your acts. And he will, he will continue this, this delusional, deceptive work in your heart and mind. And there's no, there's no end to where you can find yourself once you start down that road. A lot of people don't understand when they disobey. They think, well, I'm just disobeying in this one thing. But that's not how it works. Have you ever missed your exit going down the interstate? You're talking on the phone or you're talking to people in the vehicle and you missed your exit and you realize I just missed my exit only to find that you got to go about 10, 15 miles to get back to that, there's not an easy way to get back to the road you missed. And it seems like that's the only time I ever miss my road is when it's like that. You think, I'll just go to the next exit and I'll detour back over. No, you're on an uh, interchange, you're on some kind of beltway, there's no exits for five miles, there's no, and, and you're so frustrated, you think, man, I was just right there. Can I tell you something, in your Christian life, when you disobey God, it's not always just a quick, easy fix, get right back on track. Many people end up going all over the place and doing all kinds of things they never thought they would have to do because they disobeyed. That's the only analogy I can think of other than what we see right here. They, they refused to go up in verse number 26 and it was 40 years later. 40 years later before they were ever able to get back here and have the opportunity to make this decision again. And they just continued to allow themselves to be deceived. And 
Last week or two weeks ago, we looked at being delusional. They were delusional about the timing in chapter in Numbers chapter 13. I don't have time to repeat all of this. The timing was right. Uh, God had sent them there uh, at the time of the of the harvest and the time of the of the, uh, the the land was full of milk and honey. It was perfect. The timing was perfect. They missed that window of opportunity. They were delusional about the taste. Uh, they had literally had the fruit of that land in their hand. They had the pomegranates, the figs, they had the grapes in their hand and ate and tasted of just a little bit of what was on the other side and were able to talk themselves out of experiencing it. And it was 40 years later before they ever had the opportunity to taste Canaan again. Delusional about the truth. They were delusional about the threat. And we'll, uh, just tonight I want to just jump into part two if I can here, because not only were they delusional about reality, but second of all, write this down, you'll be delusional about relationships. As I begin to look at these verses, we're in Deuteronomy chapter number one. You can also turn over to Numbers chapter 13. Just kind of put your a ribbon or a, a marker there. We're going to be back and forth between these two places Sister passages as they give us the same account. <coughs> Excuse me. But the heart of disobedience, the act of disobedience that we find at Kadesh Barnea literally affected every single relationship in their life. I mean, the, 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 the list, I'm going to give you, I think, five tonight. Five very specific areas in their life where their relationships were completely distorted because of their act of disobedience. The greatest delusion that resulted as a result of their disobedience is in our text in Deuteronomy number one. And that is, if you want to write this down, it affected their relationship with God. Their perception of God, their understanding of God, their indictment of God in this passage is so staggering. It was actually during the missions conference when Brother Sorrell was preaching from Deuteronomy chapter number one. And when he skipped over that verse, he was preaching other verses, but he was preaching about Kadesh Barnea. But when I re- looked down and I read verse 27, I made a note in my Bible. If he didn't expound that verse, I'm preaching on that. And tonight we're looking at what happens when you and I disobey God, the devil somehow or another succeeds in giving us an extremely distorted view of God. It's right in our text. It says in verse number 26, notwithstanding you would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. And you murmured in your tents and said, because the Lord hated us. The Lord hated us. How can you arrive at such a distorted conclusion? The Lord hated us. You're standing on the edge of the Jordan River. You have been delivered miraculously through all of these plagues from the, from the iron grip of Pharaoh after being in bondage in Egypt for 400 years. And he was forcing you to make bricks and build his city. And then he got so, I mean, this is the guy that, 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 that killed all the babies because he was afraid they were gonna overpower and outnumber them. I mean, a depraved, wicked environment they were in. And then they, they had to build these bricks and build these cities. And, and in order to try and prove a point, he wouldn't even give them the straw. They had to go gather the straw and have the same quota of bricks. And the Bible refers to Pharaoh as a cruel taskmaster. And they were in bondage and they were in bitterness and bondage. And God supernaturally, through an amazing series of events with the burning bush and Moses And Aaron brings them out of Egypt after all of these plagues and then brought them through the Red Sea on dry ground. And they stood on the banks of the Red Sea and watched Pharaoh and his army literally destroyed, washing up on the shore. God has fed them water out of a rock. He's rained down manna. Miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. They're standing on the edge of the Jordan River. Right over there is Canaan. They're literally holding the grapes and the figs and the pomegranates in their hands. They've tasted the milk and honey that God has for them. And their their, their assessment of God is he hates us. It is unbelievable. How Satan causes people to get into a state of delusion after an act of rebelling and disobedience. 
And the, and, and the, spi the, the, the downward spiral, the ripple effect of that kind of an assessment of God, I can imagine where you can end up if you ever allow your mind to say, God hates me. God hates me. God said, this is my plan. This is my will for you. I want you in a land. I want to give you a land, a good land, a large land flowing with milk and honey. I mean, I'm taking you out of bondage and slavery and I'm giving you the most beautiful piece of real estate on the planet and it's all yours. That's because you hate me. I guess while I was working on this message, I thought about how many people I've witnessed in my Christian life and I've been in church my whole life get sideways with that Bible about something. And then their perception of God is so far out there. I struggle to even know how to try to help them. And I'm seeing it today. I'm seeing today the, the, the apostasy that we're seeing in our, in our country and the apostasy that I'm seeing in church members and, and, and pastors, I'm using that term loosely, but pastors, and, and, and I think, how did, you, how did you come to that conclusion? I'm gonna tell you how they got that cockeyed. Somewhere back there, they started disobeying God. And when you disobey, the devil will make sure that you blame everything and everybody but yourself for your act of disobedience. It was easier for you to just determine that God hates you than it is for you to be honest about the fact you missed God's will. It's too easy to say, I messed up. It's too easy to say, I was wrong. It's too easy to say, we should have just crossed on over. We should have just gone. But no, it's easier for you to now indict God, set yourself up on a throne higher than God and accuse a loving, compassionate God of hating you. We got people today that they hate the church. They're against the church. They're against Christianity. They're against the ministry. They're against the Bible. They justify it. And it all started with a cockeyed, distorted view of God Almighty. And you see, the, you see the bitterness. The Bible says they murmured in their tents in verse number 23. You got so bitter. They got so bitter. They were murmuring in their tents because the Lord hated us. He hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Well, he sure went to a lot of trouble to deliver you from somebody that could have done a pretty good job of destroying you if that's what he wanted. I mean, Pharaoh was doing his best to destroy him. Why bring him through the Red Sea on dry ground if you're trying to destroy him? Why give him water out of a rock if you're trying to destroy him? You don't need the Amalekites to destroy them. Just leave them out there for about four days without water and they'll all be dead. It's not that complicated. Why rain down manna? It's unbelievable at how distorted and how perverted people's thought patterns get once they disobey God. It's unbelievable. It affected their relationship with God, obviously. It was about the most severe uh, delusion that we see in this passage, but even number two, it affected their relationship with the world. It, they got a delusional perception of the enemy and of the world because of their disobedience. Look at Deuteronomy 128. Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying the people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. Really? That's a pretty big wall. That's a big wall. It's walled all the way up to heaven. That's a big wall. I've walked on top of the Great Wall of China. I've been to the Great Wall of China. I had to go up on a cable car to get up to it and then got on top of it. Now that's a big wall. But it's not walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakims there. Look with me if you would. Look with, if you would over in the next, uh, in Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13, just keep your place there in Deuteronomy 1. We're going to go back and forth. In Numbers chapter 13, 
Here's what they said in verse 31. But the men that went up with him said, we're not able to go up against the people for they're stronger than we. Why would you, how can you say that? You already saw what God did with Egypt. You already saw what God did with the armies of Egypt. You saw what God did with Pharaoh. You saw what God did. Are the, are the Anakims greater than the Egyptians were? The Egyptians were the premier army on the planet at the time. They were running the, I mean, they were, and God had destroyed them. Look at Numbers 13, verse 32. And they brought up an evil report out of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land though which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. What happened when they disobeyed God, when they made their mind up that they were not going to follow God's plan, God's purpose. They were not going to follow God's direction and God's leadership. And they rebelled against the will of God. They had a distorted perception of the world. The world's greater than us. We're no match for them. Well, that's absolutely the opposite of what Jesus said. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Right. I've overcome the world. How many times did he say that? I've overcome the world. <clears throat> and over and over and over we could go, but when you start disobeying the amount of intimidation that the world has on you affects your mind. You lose all confidence. You lose all boldness when you're disobedient. When you lose your confidence and you lose your boldness because of disobedience, the giants don't have to kill you. You kill yourself. We've got a soul winning class coming up on Sunday. Some of you have never been soul winning. You've never done it. The thought of it scares you to death. Do you realize that you will never, as long as you are embracing a disobedient lifestyle about the Great Commission, you will never have the confidence to be a soul winner. If you're waiting to feel qualified and capable and strong and bold and courageous before you are obedient, you will never, ever, ever go soul winning, ever. I'm thinking about the message Brother Sorrell preached. Trying to make a way, figure out the way. Just do it. Just go. Then God will make a way. It affected their relationship with the world. Thirdly, it affected their relationship with God's man. Look in our text in Numbers chapter 14. Look out there. You're, You're right there. Numbers 14. Look at it. Verse 1, all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. What in the world? This wasn't Moses' idea. In fact, Moses spent about two chapters at the burning bush trying to talk God out of this whole idea. He was fine where he was at. He was fine with his wife and kids working for his father-in-law, walking around out there watching those sheep. He was fine doing that. 80 years old at the burning bush. Moses, 80 years old. When God said, I want you to go and I want you to deliver my people and I want you to take them into this new land. And Moses was like, me? Who, me? Me? I don't want to do this. I'm not able. What am I going to say? Who am I going to tell them sent me? And he had all these excuses. And finally, God got Moses to submit. And Moses went. And Moses did what God told him to do. And now they're blaming Moses because they don't want to experience God's will for their life. Like it's Moses' idea. Murmuring against Moses. Murmuring against Aaron. Would God, verse 2, would God we had died in the land of Egypt or would God we had died in the wilderness? Look what they said in verse number 4. They, they, said, unto one of, uh, they said one to another, let us make us a captain and let us return unto Egypt. Make you a captain? You were there for 400 years in Egypt and you couldn't make a captain and now all of a sudden you're going to make you a captain. That's what hit me this afternoon. Oh, you got the bright idea. You're going to elect a leader. Well, why didn't you do that about 400 years ago? Because you can't. 
You couldn't then, you can't now. God put him here. God put Moses in your life. You are standing in Kadesh Barnea because of God's man, but yet they were so distorted in their thinking, they began to murmur against the man of God. How many times have I seen people in churches get a bad attitude and a bad spirit toward the one person God put in their life to try to help them become victorious, overcome sin, and experience God's will for their life? Let's murmur against the one guy in the whole crowd that gives two cents about your spiritual condition. What happened? Disobedience brings about delusion about God's man. It's amazing to me. Let's find us a captain. Let's make us a captain and let us return into Egypt. I don't, I, I, there's a part of me would have loved to have been standing that day and been, okay, um, how you propose we do this, number one? We're going to hold an election. How are we going to do this? But let's say we get one. Let's say we appoint a captain. We're going to turn around. We're going to go right back through this wilderness. We're going to backtrack. We're going to get to the edge of the Red Sea. Then what? Then what? You reckon the new guy's going to be able to do what the old guy did? You reckon God's going to give him a rod to hold out over the water? You reckon maybe that your cockeyed perception of how leadership is supposed to be is really going to get the job done? No, it's not. It's not. Let's get us a new captain. Let's go back to Egypt. It's amazing to me how the devil allows people that insist on living in disobedience, turn them against the pastor. Turn them against God's man. Turn them against the one person in their life that under protest, under protest, is standing between them and judgment. How many times did Moses pull those people fat out of the fire? How many times did he go before God and say, oh, Lord, hold on just a second. Don't destroy him. Oh, Lord, thank, Lord, please just take a minute and think about this. I know you want to. I want to. But, Lord, you can't destroy these people out here in the middle of this wilderness. What's the world going to say? The one man that stood between them and judgment is the one they choose to murmur against. It affected their relationship with God's man. Fourthly, it affected their relationship with God's people. Look at Joshua 14, verse number six. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephthah, which were with them that searched the land, rent their clothes. Now, these are the two good spies of the 12. These are the only two that's got the positive report. The other 10 bring back evil report. Watch this. They spake unto all the company of the children of Israel in verse seven. The land which we passed through to search it is exceeding good land. We've been there, we saw it. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land, verse number eight, and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not, and all the congregation bade stone them with stones. The two guys that said, listen, we've been there, we've seen it. Yes, there's giants. Yes, there's wall cities. But man, they're bred to us, meaning we'll just eat their lunch. We'll just, we'll just mow right on through them. God has brought us to this place. It's a good land, flow with milk and honey. Please don't rebel against the Lord. Please, let's cross over Jordan. Please, let's do this. And they were so upset with the two guys that were right with God that they wanted to stone them. So messed up you get in your head once you start disobeying God. The people in the church that are sold out, dedicated, committed become your enemy. How many times have I seen that? How many times have I seen carnal people, disobedient people, worldly people try to run off the people in the church that just want to go with God? It's be, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what you really want. You really want to get thrown for a loop. Contrast them. Contrast them 
with that carnal crowd over in 1 Corinthians chapter number 5 when there was the report of that, that boy that was having an affair with his father's wife and the church was puffed up about it. The carnal people want to defend the carnal people and stone the spiritual ones. It's bad. It's bad. I'm talking about delusions of disobedience. You get so messed up in your mind that all you can say is that people in the church, they think they're so spiritual. Look at them, they always go to the altar. Look at them. They always go to the altar. Well, if they was that spiritual, they wouldn't always be going to the altar. Maybe they're down there confessing all their sins. You know, the sins you're not con- confessing. They're down there confessing sins and apologizing to God and getting right with God. But when you live this carnal, disobedient life, you want to stone all the people that's trying to do right. You want to stone Joshua and Caleb? Caleb, in, the, in chapter 13, the Bible says Caleb steal the people. The Bible said Caleb steal the people before Moses. I've got this verse online in my Bible. I love this verse. I would like to think I would like to think, Dr. Bittner, that if I'd have been in this story, I'd have been doing what Caleb did. Moses is standing there talking to the people. They all begin to fall apart. They all begin to get all hysterical. And they all begin to start crying. Oh my goodness, what are we going to do? And in chapter 13, verse 30, Caleb steal the people. He stepped up in front of Moses. Preacher, if you could, let me just testify just a second. He stands up in front of Moses and says, people, everybody, just stop a minute. Y'all are all crying and belly aching and murmuring over this evil report. We are well able to overcome it. Let's go up at once. We can do this. And their, their response was to try to stone him. Got two cheerleaders in the whole crowd. I want to kill both of them. You got two people begging the nation of Israel, please, let's don't rebel against God. God's brought us here. His will is for us to go over. And they want to stone them. Number four, number five. One more point, y'all ready? It affected their relationship with God's people. But number five, this is one of the most painful ones to me. It affected their relationship with their family. I want you to look at Numbers chapter number 14. Look what they said. This is what the murmurers said. In chapter 14, verse two. I mean, they lifted up their voice and cried. People wept all night long. They wept and cried. If we could get people to weep and cry like that over sinners or over revival, we could, have a, we could have a revival. But they were lifting up their voice and crying and weeping out of disobedience and rebellion. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses, verse 2. Would God we had died in the land of Egypt. Would God we had died in the wilderness. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword. Watch this. That our wives and our children should be a prey. You see that? Look at chapter 14. Here's what God said. You're talking about heartbreaking. God said in verse 27, how long should I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I've heard the murmurings of the children of Israel which they murmur against me, say unto them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from 20 years old and upward which have murmured against me doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein save Caleb and Joshua. Watch this verse 31. But your little ones which ye said should be a prey them will I bring in And they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness. Watch verse 33. And your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years. Here we go. And bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. The children that you said were going to be a prey, they are going to be a prey. But because of you, not the Anakim's. They're going to have to bear your whoredoms. Not the Amalekites. Not the people that live in the land of Canaan. They're going to have to live for the next 40 years dealing with you. You're going to be the plague. You're going to be the one that brings your children down. You're going to be the one that causes them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And they got to bear with your whoredoms. 
You know what happens when you get to the place where you start disobeying God? All the excuses, stay with me, all the excuses and reasons that you come up with for why you can't go all in with God, well, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my kids if I go all in with God. You're going to lose them anyway. Right. And it's going to be your fault you lost them. I'm afraid if I go all in with God. I'm afraid if I make church a priority. I'm afraid if I pull my kids out of all these, all these extracurricular activities. All these, you know, the, 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 the my mind's going blank. All the, 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 the little league and, and all this little stuff. I'm afraid if I pull them out of all that and make them go to church, I'm afraid they're going to get bitter and turn on God. So what you're saying is the will of God is going to destroy your children, but the world won't? Is that what you're saying? That's exactly what you're saying. You're saying your children are safer with the devil's crowd than with God's crowd. And you're so disobedient, you convinced yourself you're right about that. I'm afraid if I put them in Christian school, I'm afraid if I put them at the church, I'm afraid if I get involved in the youth group, I'm afraid they're going to turn against God, they're going to turn against the things of God, but then you'll let them go run out with all their friends and do only God knows what all weekend long, all night long, wherever. And you trust the world with your kids better than you trust God. And I wasn't planning on saying none of that, but I just said every bit of it. Amen. I have seen people get so cockeyed with their thinking that they... It affects their relationship with their children. And your children will wander in the wilderness and have to bear your whoredoms. Yeah. Not the world's, yours. Because you disobeyed. You disobeyed. These verses have been so powerful to me that the disobedience is immediately followed by delusion and deception. And the devil will wreak havoc in your life, your mind, your heart, your family, and in the church, if you ever embrace a life of willful disobedience, just go with God. Just go with God. They say, we can't go into that land. We can't go into Canaan. It eateth up the inhabitants thereof. No, the wilderness ate them up. You're going to get eat up one way or the other. You can either get eat up in the will of God or get eat up out of the will of God. Disciples saw Jesus turn over those tables, those money changers. You know what they remembered? The words of David where David said, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. If I'm going to be eat up with something, I'd rather be eat up with zeal of God Amen. than eat up by the wilderness. Amen. Amen. What do you eat up with? Maybe we ought to get eat up with the obeying God, doing what God said. You say, I don't know how this is going to work. He didn't tell you to worry about how it worked. He just said, this is what I want you to do. Do it. And when you start making excuses and justifying and defending disobedience, the devil steps into your heart and your mind and will turn everything you know about God, the Bible, the church, the ministry, and everything. He'll turn it upside down and inside out. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed tonight. Maybe somebody needs to get an altar. Maybe, maybe you need to ask the Lord to open your understanding to see things the way they really are. Maybe the devil has skewed your perception of things. I guarantee you if he has, you can trace it back to disobedience. Maybe God gave you some light. God gave you some truth about something. And you argued with God about it and said, I don't want to do that. And you rebelled against God. And at that point, things begin to fall apart in your own mind and in your own heart.